Hi, my name is Max von Sertwitz and I'm a professor at Kaunas University of Technology in Lithuania and director of GLORAD, the research network for global R&D and innovation. The question we want to talk about here is one of the emerging hot topics in management research, reverse innovation. Reverse innovation is not reverse engineering. That has something to do with reproduction of somebody else's product. And it's not frugal innovation. That is cost-efficient innovation in a developing country for a developing country. According to two landmark papers written in 2009 and 2012 by Vijay Govindarajan, Chris Trimble, and Jeffrey Immelt, reverse innovation is an innovation first introduced in a developing country and later introduced in an advanced country. This market-based definition makes perfect sense since innovation always refers to a successful introduction of a new product or service to a market. If an invention has no success, it is not an innovation. An example for such a reverse innovation is Palmlat's Milk in a Pouch, developed for Latin American markets, or Danfoss Solar and Wind Powered Water Pump SQ Flex, aiming at markets in Africa and Asia. Both of these products were first introduced in a developing country market before later successfully introduced to advanced country markets. Well, what about these innovations? Bars Impact Screwdriver was developed in Malaysia directly for sales in advanced country markets. Good Baby designs and develops baby strollers in China directly for its customers in the United States and Europe. Most of the actual innovation, all of its creative work, the product development and engineering, has taken place in a developing country. Once finished, the product was shipped to an advanced country without ever targeting a developing country market at all. In fact, both the 2009 and the 2012 papers had referenced Vernon's product lifecycle concept, which also emphasized the location of development already. Why was product creation and development dropped? Shouldn't that be part of reverse innovation as well? That's exactly the question my collaborators and I asked ourselves. Romeo Frega, who wrote a master thesis on reverse innovation as early as 2007, Peter Soberg, and Simona Corsi, who joined me at our Shanghai-based Glorad office in 2011. What we eventually did were three things. First, we extended the notion of innovation and reverse innovation to include also the early stages of concept ideation and product development not just initial market introduction and secondary market product leave launches. Second, we combined the result with the original categorization of markets being either in developing or in advanced countries. As an innovation now moves through its various stages, the main locus of its core activity either stays put in the original country or, depending on many managerial and strategic considerations, it shifts to another country. Third, we now needed to look at the sequence of transitions between stages. It's all easy when you only have one transition to make, as in the original reverse innovation concept, or if the stages are co-located in time and space. Thus we came up with some stuff on what a flow is in innovation, and especially in this context, the reversal of such a flow. But we won't bore you with the details. If you're really interested, please read the paper published in JPAM that you can find at the URL here. Because we now looked at innovation as a flow rather than a simple market transition, we also had to update the definition of reverse innovation, which now reads as any type of global innovation that, at some stage during the innovation, is characterized by a reversal of the flow of innovation from a developing country to an advanced country, and that is eventually introduced to an advanced country market. So what makes an innovation shift from one country to another? where well, companies sometimes move responsibility for product development and R&D because they want it to be closer to a lead market, or because they think it can be done less expensively in a low-cost country. Sometimes they just don't have the bandwidth to do it in the original location, but they have free resources somewhere else. Or the original idea happened in a place that never had full development capabilities, so it needed to shift to a place that has. Of course, besides those four mentioned, there are many other reasons possible as well. So what did we achieve with this? Well, mostly a bit of conceptual clarity. If you have two options, how to transition from one stage to the next, for instance, stay in your advanced market country or move the innovation to a developing country, you really work your way through a binary transition tree that looks a little bit like this. 
Of course, not all of these paths are reverse innovations, but surprisingly a full 10 of them are. Out of 16 total flows, all of which are global, except if the innovation stays in the same country throughout its genesis, a special subcase of the first and the last of these flows. So what's new about this? For one, we actually expanded on what is considered a reverse innovation. In the old definition, only four of these global paths could be considered reverse, those marked in blue. In the new definition, we added six more possible global innovation paths that are reverse. Four of these originate in a developing country market, thus giving more exposure to new product creation from a part of the world usually not in a limelight of innovation. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of reverse innovation not previously considered. For instance, let's take a look at an ADAA innovation, which we labeled as a cost or capacity innovation because that's one of the main reasons why an innovation has its cost and labor-intensive product development and testing phase conducted in a developing country. This is the case for the electronic switching systems Siemens developed in India for its German customers, or high-end TV setup boxes that ST Microelectronics developed in its Indian R&D center for advanced global markets. Or let's take a look at a DEDAD innovation. For instance, SAP's Business One suite conceived and invented in their China R&D labs, targeting and selling in advanced country markets. Or good babies baby strollers that follow a DDAA path ideated and developed in China for customers operating exclusively in high-end markets such as the United Kingdom or the Netherlands. Almost as a byproduct, here's an interesting takeaway. Reverse innovation can also originate in developing countries, and it can be initiated by emerging market multinationals. It is also a reverse innovation if only parts of the development take place in a developing country, or even if the innovation is not introduced in a developing country first, which is a defining condition in the old version of reverse innovation, or if the innovation is marketed entirely in an advanced country market only. That leaves us with the most important question, so what? What does this mean for the betterment of innovation theory and practice? Most importantly, our model is a tool. It is a research tool not unlike Darwin's model of evolution, which has helped scientists classify new species as they were discovered. It is also a management tool for R&D and innovation executives who want to find out which of their global innovation projects succeed and which don't, and why they don't. How many projects were started but did not succeed? Do you detect a pattern? For instance, do most of your developing country-initiated innovations fail to make the transition back to an advanced market unit? Should you be worried about product cannibalization concerns of your local country managers? Or should you focus on overcoming the not invented here syndrome in your headquarters R&D center? What really is the problem here? And what solutions might work across the entire class of innovations? Or better even, why not proactively address those issues by designing your global innovation organization so that these problems never even occur? Why not train global project leaders so that they are aware of the natural and cultural inclinations of their downstream innovation partners, thereby overcoming possible rejections and improving the chances of reverse innovation? These are questions we cannot answer with our model alone but we can contextualize them and articulate them for future problem solvers. Many thanks for watching this introduction to reverse innovation, which was published in the Journal of Product Innovation Management. And don't forget to look us up at www.glorad.org to get the latest on global R&D and innovation research.